Hello, my lovelies. Here we are in the middle of January, and I'm wondering how those of you who've made a resolution are doing. I started the year talking about how resolutions can be a setup for failure. And I also feel that way about having a word of the year sometimes because you have no idea how your year is going to go. And I've seen people get so worked up when their resolutions or their word of the year isn't working out the way they wanted them to. But oftentimes they fail because of self-sabotage from the word go. Look, I know there are people who will tell you that it doesn't matter if you've never made a success of your business and you decide you're going to make half a million dollars this year. But for most people, a goal like that means they're setting themselves up for failure and self-sabotage. Why? Because they can't see themselves actually doing the thing they're aspiring to do. Yes, there's a small group of people that get a burning desire and they do the thing, but often these people accomplish that goal at a high price. One of the most interesting cases I've ever seen is a very successful YouTuber that I know of who published 30 videos in 30 days for multiple years in a row during a specific month of the year. And it was their peak time for their demographic. It launched them into superstardom and incredible YouTube success, but every year they got sick and landed in bed for weeks afterward. To me, that's not true success. To them, it might have been, but I think there's a much healthier way to get there. Let me be clear, I have great admiration for this person on so many levels. And if you happen to know who this is, I will fight you if you say anything other than that. They're an incredible business person and they have created a level of success I can only hope to emulate. They're kind and they're generous and they're amazing in so many ways. So this isn't about liking or not liking someone. And they may be perfectly happy with the results of their activity, But for most people, it's just too much. So how do we become successful without that and without self-sabotage? As you can probably guess, that depends on your personality. So let's look at that and see where it takes us. Everything I teach is based on working with our personalities rather than against them. And when you do that, you hugely reduce the possibility of self-sabotage and you increase the possibility of genuine success. That doesn't come at a price. You only realize after you've paid it. If you don't know what I mean by that, we'll get to it, so stay tuned. For those who are new to the podcast, when I talk about personalities, I use the DISC personality model of behavior and refer to people as D or driven, I or inspired, S or supportive, and C or cautious. Also, I work towards people's strengths rather than focus on how to change them because when you focus on strengths, you see the most amazing transformations. It's like magic when someone gets themselves and learns to work in their zone of genius. So let's get into this. Starting with the D personality, they love and seek challenges. So this self-sabotage idea may not seem to apply to them, but actually it really does. These are the people who do challenges like Ironman, 75 hard, or even seeing how many days in a row they can work out. That in and of itself is not a bad thing. But the driven personality thinks that failure is not an option. And that can lead to some pretty dire consequences if they're out of balance. I've known people who continue to work out when they're ill because they can't stand the idea of breaking a workout streak. While that may seem relatively harmless, it can be very dangerous. For example, over 200 people have perished since 1986 in duathlons and triathlons from ages 15 to 80. I mentioned the ages because the people that pass away do so from a myriad of causes, although drowning seems to be near the top of the list. But while there may not be a consistent reason for the deaths, I conjecture there are some personality traits they have in common, and if they're willing to go to the point of endangering their life, I would call that self-sabotage. I get that some people would have a different view of that, and that's okay. D's like the thrill and the danger. It pushes them to push through, and that's great until it isn't. 
Also, let me be clear. I'm not criticizing those who compete in these activities because some compete at a much healthier level. They do their best and know when to quit if their well-being is at risk. That's the difference between being in balance and out of balance. And that can make the difference between life and death. When talking about things like self-sabotage, people in balance know when they're working at a healthy level and when they're approaching self-sabotage levels and they walk away or readjust. These are the driven personalities that succeed in a huge way without losing the people around them or destroying themselves in the process. And that is a superpower of the driven personality. They hate giving up. I put that in air quotes, but they will stop what they're doing if it's going to harm them. Also, I'm not talking about stopping because things get challenging. Challenge inspires the depersonality, but for them, there's sometimes a fine line between challenging and dangerous. And the balanced depersonality knows the difference. And if they tend to ignore that, hopefully they have someone in their lives that can give them a nudge and bring them back into balance. If you have a driven person in your life, know that they sometimes don't see their limits and they need someone to intervene. My oldest son is this way, or at least he was. And like most teenagers that have the D personality, his feeling of being limitless was huge. He played varsity soccer. He played club soccer. He had a part-time job and a girlfriend and took several AP classes. In fact, I made him limit the number of AP classes that he took his senior year to the ones that he could actually use for college credit from the AP tests because he wanted to take them all. He wasn't happy when I limited him in his junior year because that's when we had to make that decision, but he was happy in the spring of his senior year when that rolled around because he had some breathing room in his schedule. It wasn't a fight when we made that decision. It was the decision that we made together. And although he felt like he could do the work, something that we affirmed, it gave him time to enjoy the end of his senior year rather than survive it. In retrospect, he was grateful that we guided him to a situation that gave him that opportunity. Now, for the I personality, it is so easy for them to self-sabotage because there are so many things they don't want to do, especially if they're not fun. Tasks are not something in the inspired personality's wheelhouse to start with. And if those tasks are boring or long and detailed, that makes it so much easier for the fun-loving I personality to avoid them. Because this starts when the I personality is a child, they often become painfully aware of their own self-sabotage early on. Unless they have an adult around them who's willing to understand them though, knowing self-sabotage exists and knowing how to deal with it are two entirely different things. Add some neurodivergence into the mix and you've really got a recipe for disaster. You know, I remember when I was younger, I loved school. I really did. I was that kid that looked forward to summer ending and school starting because I got bored with summer and I wanted to change. I loved seeing my friends every day at school and learning. I also wanted the teachers to like me, yet another trait of the I personality. We want people to like us. And for most of the time, that was enough for me to get good grades. I could complete assignments and study for tests, but then starting in about fourth grade, there was always this long-term project. And while the teachers helped a bit, I was not equipped to go through that longer process on my own, nor was I equipped to explain why I couldn't seem to do what others could do easily because I was mostly a straight A student. It was frustrating for me and everyone around me. And I can still see the look of disappointment from my teachers and my parents when I failed over and over again at those types of projects. Then I got to college as an English writing major and communications major. I had so many papers and projects that you would think I would have learned how to overcome those obstacles. But the truth is that unless I really liked the subject, I continued to struggle. 
Knowing what I know now and looking back, I can see the I personality traits so clearly. One of the best projects I ever did was my final thesis for my communication major when I studied the show Miami Vice. For those who are not familiar with the show, Miami Vice was groundbreaking in the way that they filmed and for their use of music as part of the story. I had a great time writing that thesis, and it may have been the best single piece of work I created in college, which is probably why I got an A plus on it. (laughs) And I was more proud of that A than anything else I created in college. So how does the I personality overcome self-sabotage? Generally with other people's help or by making the task as much fun as they possibly can, whatever that means to them. Music, timers, and favorite shows playing in the background can all help the inspired personality get, well, inspired. Moving on to the S personality, the self-sabotage for them is it almost always has something to do with the other people in their lives. While the supportive person loves to help others, Sometimes they do that at their own expense. I cannot tell you how many S moms and business women tell me that they can't get anything done because their people constantly need them. And it seems like no matter what they do, something interrupts them that they need to take care of and that they never seem to get to their own things. So do we know what the actual self-sabotage is? Yes, that would be lack of boundaries. In the best of circumstances, S personalities struggle with boundaries. When they're out of balance, the S personality can let people run all over them. To get past that, it helps for the supportive person to know that when they support themselves first, that they can support their people so much better. Probably the best phrase I've ever heard for supportive personality is to drink while you pour. Because it's so easy for the S personality to pay attention to others, so much so that they neglect themselves. They can lose sleep and set everything else aside that they do for themselves to help others. But eventually that comes at a cost because the S person begins to resent being pulled in so many directions. And that's when the meltdowns come. They often start with a little sarcasm or maybe some passive aggressiveness because the supportive person's natural tendency to help is being taken advantage of. And they aren't sure how to make it stop until they get to the point of boiling over because they don't want to be unkind or unreasonable. But sometimes the kindest thing that the S personality can do is set reasonable expectations and boundaries that help both people. I struggled with this in my own family. And for those of you who don't know, my personality type is an ISD and my I and my S are almost equal. So I I truly understand both the I and the S intimately. And I struggled with this in my own family for a long time. You see, I thought that to be a good daughter, wife, mother, sister, and friend, I had to drop everything for everyone whenever they needed me. The biggest mistake of that was that it taught my family that my time was unimportant and had no value other than when I was helping them. By doing that, I never seemed able to get anything accomplished because somebody always interrupted. And it was particularly frustrating when I was in the flow because when you have ADHD like I do and someone breaks the flow, it may break for a few minutes, but more likely it could break for days or weeks. And I am serious about that. And at the time, it never occurred to me that I could simply not answer a phone or set a boundary that when I was working, my people could wait. And it got so bad at one point that I actually had to create ridiculous rules or be almost nasty to get people to understand that I couldn't be at their beck and call all the time. And just in case you think I'm kidding, to even get 15 minutes to work on a project uninterrupted when my kids were younger, and I'm talking about the teen and tween age, not toddlers, I had to tell them that unless someone was in need of medical or attention, or I needed to call the police, they needed to take care of themselves for 15 minutes. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but 
I would be willing to bet that every S personality mom who has ever had to make an important phone call with kids in the house knows exactly what I mean. Two things helped me with self-sabotage where these types of issues kept creeping up. The first was setting up my day to maximize productivity and the ability to take advantage of pockets of time when my children were out of the house or sleeping. In my case, my children slept in. They sleep. They used to sleep late, and I'm an early riser. During the summer, I got to the point where I could get enough done by 10 a.m. that when they rolled out of bed, I could, I'd be done with my work, and it allowed for the interruptions for them for the rest of the day. During the school year, I knew that I had a set amount of time each day to be productive. And I used that time as well as I could so that when the kids came home, I was present for them. And while that sounds like a long day, it really wasn't. I used to call it the three-hour launch because my kids left an hour apart starting, they left at 6.30, 7.30, and 8.30, and they started coming home at like 2.30, 3.30, and 4.30. So there was a lot of a lot of uptime to get them out and a lot of uptime to bring them back home. So I would squeeze it all in there, especially when I had meetings and things like that. So I wanted to use that time as well as I could so that I could be present for them when they did, when they were in the home. Did it always work? <laughs> no. <laughs> but being mindful of the time that I had to do my tasks helped keep me focused so I could be present for my family. And also note that I'm not telling anybody that they need to do things the way I did it. I know a lot of moms who have early risers who do most of their work in the evenings after their children have gone to bed. And if that works for you, you go girl. I am all about making life work for you. If neither of those options feels like they'll ever work for you, then you and I need to talk. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. So moving on to the C personality, Self-sabotage for them usually comes in one of two ways. Overthinking that keeps them from getting started or perfectionism that keeps them from finishing. And although both can easily come into play, I know that every C personality out there wants everything they do to be perfect. And they almost always create high quality work that they're sure that they could have been better at. And the thing is, they're probably right. And I know even saying that makes the C personality raise their eyebrows because then they feel like they can never win. But I would counter that a C personality is like an Olympic athlete in that they can put in the best performance of their lives. And unless they earn a perfect score in everything they attempt, they can always improve, even if they are the best in the world at what they do. You know, people like Michael Phelps, Katie Ledecky, Usain Bolt, and Jackie Joyner Kersey are the best at what they do and did, but they always wanted to improve. And that can either be a healthy or unhealthy thing. And that's why sometimes the best cure for a C personality self-sabotage is a firm deadline. If it's imposed by someone else, the C personality wants to do things right. And doing it right would mean turning it in on time or stopping at a given time. When left to their own devices, though, the deadline may never come. That's why a deadline set by someone else or a mutual deadline from working in conjunction with someone else is helpful for the C personality because public accountability is a standard they would never want to fail to meet Where, when it comes to the requirements of the task. And as much as the C personality enjoys working alone and should do so as much as possible, having that public deadline is exactly what helps them to keep focused and on task to complete their amazing work and get it out to the world. So if you're working with the C personality, give them the parameters, include the required deadline or deadlines, and let them do their thing. If you are a C personality, Understand that no one will ever be able to do the amount of detailed work that you can do. But sometimes you need some outside pressure to actually do your best work and know when to stop, which is actually gives you the chance for your work to see the light of day. And while self-sabotage is much easier to see in tasks and projects, 
for anyone. It also shows up in relationships. But when you're dealing with relationships, it gets even more complicated because you're dealing with two personalities and their interactions are unique to their personalities as well as their circumstances. And that's one of the big advantages of understanding personality types of yourself and your family members so you can help each other succeed like never before. That's also why in February, I'll be running a special for couples, but you need to be on my email list to get that special discount. So head over to the Moving Toward Better website and sign up for the email list today. That way you're gonna get that awesome discount. And also, if you're an affiliate of mine, I've got a special offer for you too in February, so you don't wanna miss that either. And that's a way for you to make a little extra cash as well. So what should you do next? Like I said, go to the Moving Toward Better homepage and join our email community. There are so many wonderful things coming and you're not gonna wanna miss them. So sign up and find out what they are. Love you all, see you next time. At Moving Toward Better, it's our mission to help you unlock a fantastic life powered by what's unique and authentically you. To learn how we can help you in your quest, head over to movingtowardbetter.com to check it out or use the links in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being you and have a great day. Love you all.